Hello friends, welcome to Inside 360 Europe edition. We follow all the news so you don't have to. Today's topics are EU falling ever further behind US, European countries up defense spending and early ECB rate cut divides council. But we start with a quick look at the financial markets. European stocks turned mostly higher on Thursday with the stocks 50 rising by 0.2% to 4,600 and 49 as investors were analyzing the latest inflation figures for the Eurozone and the latest Bank of England monetary policy report. In January, Eurozone inflation fell to 2.8% in line with expectations and the core rate eased to 3.3%, the lowest since March 2022, but slightly above forecasts. Meanwhile, the Bank of England decided to keep rates steady but removed any mention of further tightening. In the US, Fed Chair Jerome Powell mentioned the possibility of rate cuts this year, although it is unlikely to happen in March. Many Europeans are facing a new economic reality that they haven't experienced in decades. They are experiencing a decline in their wealth, as mentioned by the Business Daily. In 2008, both the Eurozone and the US had similar gross domestic products at current prices, amounting to 14.2 trillion and 14.8 trillion respectively. Fast forward 15 years, the Eurozone's GDP has only slightly surpassed 15 trillion dollars, while US GDP has soared to 26.9 trillion dollars. As a result, the GDP gap now stands at 80%. The European Center for International Political Economy a Brussels-based think tank published a ranking of GDP per capita of American states and European countries. Italy is just ahead of Mississippi, the poorest of the 50 states, while France is between Idaho and Arkansas, respectively ranking 48th and 49th. Germany doesn't fare much better. It is positioned between Oklahoma and Maine, ranking 38th and 39th. The reasons for this disparity are complex, so let's take a closer look. The aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis provides an important background for understanding this difference. Both the EU and the US were significantly affected, but their paths to recovery and subsequent growth diverged noticeably after 2011. The United States embarked on a path of strong recovery, driven by proactive monetary policies, a surge in technological innovation, and a vibrant internal market that together propelled its economy forward. On the other hand, the EU's recovery was more cautious, hampered by the debt crises in several of its member countries, particularly in Southern Europe, and a more conservative approach to fiscal policy. A key factor in the US's impressive economic progress since 2011 has been its leading position in cutting-edge industries such as information technology, biotechnology and artificial intelligence. Back in 2000, at the Lisbon European Council, European leaders set an ambitious goal of becoming, quote, the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world by 2010. The 2000s were truly a decade of knowledge, but mainly in the US, with the rise of Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and now artificial intelligence. This prosperity is clearly evident on Wall Street, where Apple is valued at $2.8 trillion, Microsoft at $2.4 trillion, and Meta and Tesla at $750 billion. These industries have not only made a significant contribution to the US GDP, but they have also positioned the country as a global innovation leader. While the EU still possesses strengths in certain areas of technology and high quality research, it has struggled to keep pace with the rapid advancements seen in these sectors. This disparity in technological progress has had significant implications for economic growth. Investment and business environment play a significant role in shaping different economic paths. The United States has consistently attracted substantial foreign direct investment and is widely regarded as a welcoming space for business and entrepreneurship. This has greatly contributed to its rapid GDP growth. In contrast, the EU, with its strict regulations and diverse economic landscape, has encountered hurdles in establishing a comparably favorable climate for business expansion and investment. The labor market dynamics in the two regions also contribute to this story. The US labor market has shown greater resilience and dynamism, maintaining lower unemployment rates compared to the EU. On the other hand, the European labor market has struggled with higher unemployment rates, especially among young people in certain member countries, and a general sense of rigidity. Recent years have only emphasized these differences. The US-China trade war, 
Brexit and the various responses to the COVID-19 pandemic have further distinguished the economic landscapes of the EU and the US. The EU faces additional challenges due to its bureaucratic structure and slow decision-making process. With an increasing top-down approach and a primary focus on sustainability rather than economic growth and entrepreneurship, it is challenging to envision the EU reversing this trend in the near future. There is a field where the European Union excels. Regulation. The EU has set the standard in regulating mergers, carbon emissions, data privacy and e-commerce competition. However, it is debatable whether these efforts directly benefit the well-being of its citizens. They certainly do not contribute to economic growth. And now the EU intends to do the same with AI. In December, it revealed a comprehensive draft law that prohibits certain types of AI, tightly regulates others and imposes significant fines for violators. The European Commission, the EU's executive arm, may investigate Microsoft's partnership with OpenAI for potential anti-competitive behavior. The phrase, America innovates, China replicates, Europe regulates, accurately captures the distinctive strengths of each region like never before. For example, European regulators have been cautious about approving mergers that would lead to a small number of mobile phone carriers per market in order to maintain healthy competition. As a result, Europe currently has 43 groups operating 102 mobile operators, serving a population of 474 million. In comparison, the US has three major networks serving a population of 335 million, according to telecommunications consultant John Strand. China and India have even more concentrated markets. Consequently, European mobile customers pay only about a third of what Americans do, which is great news for them. However, European carriers invest only half as much per customer, resulting in networks that are comparatively not as good. It is estimated that bringing European networks up to the level of the US would require an investment of approximately $300 billion. The bureaucrats in Brussels with their excessive regulation and almost religious focus on sustainability are creating rules that are becoming increasingly complex for their citizens and companies to adhere to. Unfortunately, this is having a negative impact on much needed private investments and hindering economic development. As a result, the people are experiencing financial difficulties. In several European countries, there is a noticeable shift towards the right side of the political spectrum, which suggests that many citizens are frustrated with the current political class and desire a return to more traditional policies. Hopefully, with time, this will improve the situation and Europe will once again be able to compete with the US in economic development. The possibility of Donald Trump being re-elected as president is encouraging European allies to urge their neighbors to increase defense spending. European leaders are currently having discussions on how to prepare for a potential change in US administration. However, they are facing difficulties in reaching an agreement on the necessary actions to be taken. While NATO members are gradually increasing their defense budgets, the main concern is whether they can effectively convey to Trump that they are not taking advantage of the situation. The topic of military spending will be addressed in the upcoming meetings of the EU's defense ministers and NATO's defense ministers. European Central Bank policymaker François Villeroy de Galao has suggested that interest rate cuts could potentially happen at any of the ECB's upcoming meetings this year, indicating differing opinions among officials. This follows ECB President Christine Lagarde's statement at the last Governing Council meeting that it was premature to discuss rate cuts. While some policymakers, like Klaas Knott of the Netherlands, believe that the ECB should wait for an improvement in wages before reducing borrowing costs, Villeroy and others argue that delaying action could also carry risks. Currently, money markets show a strong possibility of a rate cut by April. That's all for this week's episode. We sincerely hope you enjoyed it and found the information provided helpful. If you have any suggestions or would like to discuss the topics covered, please feel free to leave a comment below. We'll be back soon with a brand new episode. Thank you so much for watching and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care and goodbye.